Okay, so this is, again, um, one of my favorite short stories because it is so peculiar and so weird and unsettling and all that kind of stuff. Not descriptors I'd use to describe myself, hopefully, but maybe others would. Anyway, um, The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe is a story very much... When we were, when we were thinking about I Stand Here Ironing, we were thinking about tone and the evident uh, relationship the narrator has with her daughter and how it is we might identify that and describe that, uh, this is a story where we could certainly talk about tone um, and our narrator's relationship um, with um, Fortunato uh, and the unfortunate Fortunato, as you will see from your reading, or maybe not so unfortunate. I guess it all depends what it is he did to our narrator, which we never actually learn uh, in the course of the story. But boy, do we learn about the punishment. Um, there is certainly a tone that we can infer from that relationship, but I think we also can take some time here to think about the concept of mood. Um, your relationship with the story, your emotional relationship with the story, the emotions the story kind of summons up in you, creates in you, um, challenges you with as you go through the tale. Now, before we have a discussion about that, though, we have to move beyond kind of simple, you know, cynicism or simple confusion or simple rejection. Now, when, here's what I mean by that. When I first started talking about Bartleby, uh, I think it was maybe the first or second Bartleby um, lecture in which I had, I spoke for vocabulary, about vocabulary for a very long period of time. And I'm not going to rehash all of that here. I'm just going to suggest to you that all those issues, all of those important kind of conclusions we might come to about vocabulary and literature's capacity to build our vocabulary are certainly relevant to this story, which is all the way of saying that this story is written in English you are probably not entirely familiar with. Um, there will probably be a lot of new words here, a lot of new terms. We have Poe doing all kinds of funny stuff. Uh, he's using all kinds of archaic terms. He's making all kinds of references to this Italian mask or this, this Italian festival. And so there's a lot of terms here that aren't going to be familiar with you. And that's okay, right? The Norton is going to give you, not the Norton, excuse me, the Seagull Reader. If only we were working with the Norton. No, the Seagull Reader um, is going to give you all of these annotations uh, on the bottom of the page, which will oftentimes help you out, okay? This is probably one of the more heavily annotated stories in the Norton, and that's just because Edgar Allan Poe is who Edgar Allan Poe is, or was, anyway. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of vocabulary challenges. But if you just say, okay, if you just say, I understand that, that's going to be part of the ride, that's that's how it's going to be. If I just, you know, if, if I just, if I go for a, a ride on a boat or a ship, you know, and I might understand, you know what, the waters might be rough. I might get a little queasy, but boy, is it going to be worth it for the view. And when you read a story like The Cask of Amontillado, I would strongly suggest that it is more than worth the view. So what we're getting in this story, right, is we have this really peculiar, hopefully peculiar, first-person narrator. And all we really know is that he feels slighted. He feels that he has been wronged, right? He has been wronged in a substantial way by Fortunato. Now, over the course of the story, one of the things that becomes apparent is if Fortunato did indeed slight our narrator, he seems not to either be aware of it or he seems to think that he can get away without acting as if our narrator knows what it is he did. And what he did is, is totally left up to the imagination, right? We're not quite sure what this guy did to anger this other guy, but boy, did he anger him. And as we get over, or as we go through the story, we learn about this plot that our narrator has. Now, at this point, again, I would strongly suggest to you, if you haven't read the story yet, read the story before you listen to me, because the whole point of this story is the ending, right? Or a big part of this story is the ending, where, and now we're going to get into it, our narrator takes Fortunato into, he tricks him, right, into a wine cellar, which is actually a crypt, and he leads him deeper and deeper and deeper into this crypt, to essentially uh, a, a, an end space where there's a, uh, a spot in the wall that he's dug out for him. Uh, and he tricks Fortunato into the space, chains him there, and then 
In one of the most terrifying turns in any short story written by an American, he proceeds to slowly wall him up in the basement and then leave. And it's not just that he leaves, it's that he gets away with it. If you flip to the very last page in the story, right? So he's telling all of this to us in the past tense, right? I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them in pace requisite. Okay, so he, this he's telling us here at the end, he did this 50 years ago. So this is somebody, you know, either near the end of their life um, or at some very, very distant point in time, revealing this horrifying crime that he has committed. So when we when we read the story, and let's start with tone because that's what we're more familiar with. When we read the story and we think about, okay, well what is his relationship with uh with with Fortunato? And the answer is, well, it's there's a lot of rage, right? There's a lot of manipulation. There's a tone of um he's livid. He's he's extraordinarily angry. And we get these we get evidence along the way that backs that up. For example, let's look at the very first paragraph on page 390, the thousand injuries, the thousand injuries. What happened? The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as I best could. But when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You who so well know the nature of my soul, raises questions about who he's talking to. We'll, know, we'll not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length, I would be avenged. Okay, so he hates this guy, right? He hates him intensely. And we see his hatred in a number of ways. We see it in his flattery. We see it in the way he describes him and he describes his actions. We see in the way that he manipulates him, all to get him into this basement, all for the purposes of getting him to the, the, the dungeon he has erected at the end of the basement where he can wall up Fortunato and leave him. Um, if we, so, so, so we might say, well, what's the mood of the story? And that's a whole different question because that relates to you. Now, if your mood is... I'm just confused because I don't know the words. Okay, that's legitimate, but you have to move beyond that. Okay, you have to say, okay, what's going on here? What's he trying to describe? What does this general story engender in me in terms of an emotional response? And a lot of that's going to depend upon who you are. Some people will experience a mood of terror because they realize that our narrator has something planned and that it's not good and that he's drawing Fortunato ever closer to it over the course of the story and the tension becomes higher and higher and higher until we get to the point where he ties him up and starts to wall him up forever in the, in the basement. Some of us will be terrified. Some of us will be horrified, right? This is too much. This is too grotesque. This is too over the top. Reading this makes me uncomfortable. I might have a nightmare, right? That's, that's, that's more than I wanted, thank you very much, out of this English class. I will very happily go back to my non-storytelling classes now that I've been, I've been marked with the cask of Amontillado. Some of us will take a great deal of joy in watching our narrator put this uh, punishment that he's devised together, right? I've been wrong and now I'm going to get revenge. Some people might say, yes, I like reading good revenge stories, maybe for personal reasons, but you might like to see somebody get revenge. Many of you, some of my students, I don't know if any of you are, but many of my students are criminal justice majors, right? You might wonder, hey, how, how, how can you get away with this? How could you get away with something like this? Wouldn't there be clues that would be left behind? So there's bound to be a range of reactions, depending upon who you are, but the, the, that doesn't mean you get away without any responsibility as a reader at when you're communicating about the story, 
what you have to be able to do is express why and how and for what reason you have the reaction that you do, right? Um, do you feel bad for Fortunato? Do you not? Do you think our narrator had kind of a brilliant plan? Do you think he's he's very disturbing? He's very disturbing, I would say, for a number of reasons. One is that um, he he seems so consumed by his perce his perception of an insult that Fortunata either doesn't understand that he's delivered to him or, or doesn't see it as being significant enough to warrant this kind of action, right? Because if you knew that you wronged somebody, like if you knew that you really wronged somebody in a big way and somebody said to you, hey, let's go down to the basement, <laughs> uh, you would probably be reluctant to do that. Now, Fortunato is drunk. I think that's really important, right? Throughout the course of the story, he's drinking quite a bit. So his vision certainly could have been clouded. But whenever I read this story, I always come away thinking Fortunato had no idea what was about to happen because Fortunato had no idea he insulted this guy. But there was a perceived insult and the response was dramatic and horrifying and incredibly grim, right? As we understand from the likely fate that would have arrived for you if you were walled up in a basement, um, starvation alone in the dark. Um, not a very pleasant thing to think about or describe. So the story might create a mood in you, okay? An emotional response, okay? Um, any number of emotional responses. You could have a range of emotional responses. And then we might start to think about, well, why does that happen? How does that response, if it's a dark mood, if it's a, if it's, if it's a scary story, if it's an upsetting story, if it's an unsettling story, you know, there's the fact that so much of the story takes place in the dark at night and then underground with, in, a, in essentially a crypt-like environment with skeletons that have been kind of pulled off the walls uh, at certain parts of the crypt uh, to make room for this trap that our narrator has devised. Um, does our narrator strike you as scary because there are people like that out there in the world, necessarily, who might simply misperceive someone's actions and respond with horrifying force, horrifying violence, right? It's an, uh, it's an unsettling thought that you could anger somebody and not even know that you've angered them. Um, somebody who might act like a very good friend to you as well. So there's this real unsettling nature to the story, right? Um, and when we read it, we might say, you know, well, what, what, does, what does this story do? Does it make me uncomfortable? Yeah, it does make me uncomfortable. Why does it make me uncomfortable? It makes me uncomfortable because of the way the narrator goes about his business and how he does this and does this and does this. In terms of where we want to go in the class, right, we want to be thinking a lot about finding the best evidence in the story to support our description of the mood. So we don't just say, well, I had a reaction to it, but I don't know why. What we need to do is make sure always that when we're reading, we're annotating, we're making notes, we're leaving a trail for ourselves of comments so that when we go back to the story, we can say, well, you know what? Here are the things that really got my attention. If these are the things that really got your attention, these are probably the things you had an emotional response to, okay, or a complicated intellectual response to, and those are the things you can begin to talk about. Those are the things you can begin to detail, describe, explain in terms of how and why you think it had that effect on you. Okay, so the mood of the story. We've talked a little bit about mood in the context of other stories that we've read, but we might talk about the mood of Carrie. And there's probably a number of moods that could be associated with this. But when I was first introducing the text to you, I mentioned, you know, I, I, I've had hundreds of students enjoy this book, at least they, they told me. I've had probably a handful say that it was too offensive for them to complete. Uh, the mood that it engendered in them was something that they found to be intolerable. Um, and traditionally, when that's arisen, um, it's come from, in terms of my classes that I taught, it's come in the context of comments about religion and the role of religion in the book. Although there are a number of other things people might respond to in this text and say, you know, that's, that's much more than I want um, in a story. You know, the mood that it engenders is not one that I, I find a reasonable one for me to proceed through a course with. You know, as someone who teaches literature, I would say that's what literature is for, but... I'm not going to push anybody over the cliff who doesn't want to go there. Certainly respect people's points of view and people's observations. 
uh, in that regard. And so usually I'll find another book for someone to read that, them, that might not challenge them in the same way. But it engenders a mood. Um, sometimes, you know, all the sexual content, all the language, all the drug use, all this, lots of stuff in here people could have a, 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 a reaction to. But we don't want to think about mood as just being negative, right? Because mood can also be curious. I wonder about this person. I'm excited to learn more about this person. I want to find out what happens to this person. I want to find out why this person acts the way they do. I want to understand why these people interact with one person the way they do. It creates a, a mood of expectation, a mood of curiosity, a mood of wonder, perhaps, in the reader as they go through. And a good reader and a good novel is going to move you through a series of moods, right? Like, for example, um, the scenes with Margaret White are, are deeply upsetting. Deeply upsetting. Um, but that's not all the book is, right? It moves us in and out of scenes like that so that the mood fluctuates, changes over time, just like Flannery O'Connor does so masterfully in A Good Man is Hard to Find. If the whole short story had the same mood as the last three pages, that would be a really difficult short story to get through. I mean, that'd be grim. It's grim at the end, certainly, but it's not at the beginning necessarily, right? And so she takes us on this experience and we go with her and we see, we react to different sections in different ways because we're thinking about what we're reading, we're reflecting on what we're reading, and we're wondering how it connects to the larger story. So when you read The Cask of Amontillado, okay, um, one of the things that you might have some kind of reaction to is the fact that our narrator is taking what appears to be a great deal of joy in his act of murder, which is upsetting. It's also curious, right? Why would he act that way? What could lead a human being to such a reaction? as the one he's having here. Now, we don't have answers for that in the story, but what we do get is this really interesting personality. Interesting might be the operative word there, but there is this well-defined personality, a very unsettling personality. Again, the one who would perceive a slight that may or may not even exist and respond with deadly force to it. Um, an interesting, interesting character. So. We'll have a number more interesting stories, but Edgar Allan Poe, um, I, I like to teach this class with as little commentary on the biographical information of these authors as I can. Surely you've heard the name Edgar Allan Poe before. If you haven't, you should go back to your high school and, you know, ask your English teachers why that's the case. But Edgar Allan Poe is just, is just such a wonderful writer as an early American writer who kind of sets the stage for a lot of people who would come later. He's the guy who essentially popularizes the idea of the short story, which is why you're holding the Seagull Reader in your hands if you have the book for the course, which I hope you do. Okay, he's the he doesn't create the short story, but he's absolutely the one who helps work to make it a popular format for literature. And he's absolutely the person who expresses the idea that, you know, why don't we have stories that can be finished in a single evening? He's saying that in a time when novels are enormous and multi-volume and require a great deal of effort to get through uh, just in terms of time. Why don't we have a short experience? And he certainly does that. He's kind of the master of the form. And when we read this story, um, one of the things we see is the significance of a well-developed character to a story. I won't ramble on much longer than that. I'm, uh, I got a little off track there. He's just a lot of fun. If you like this, you've probably heard The Raven, the poem The Raven. Other famous stories by him are The Fall of the House of Usher, which I strongly recommend, uh, The Pit and the Pendulum, okay, um, and a great deal of the poetry, I would say, is just absolutely worth your time uh, if you ever want to give it a try. Anyway, The Cask of Amontillado, Edgar Allan Poe. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, it's a very interesting story, and again, it helps us reflect a little bit more on this concept of mood how and why it is we respond to stories, and what it is the author may be doing to make us respond as we do.